and welcome to the Hales Owen Apostolic Church. Apostolic meaning what God says, not what man thinks. Please enjoy this teaching, and if you want more, visit the website at halesowenapostolicchurch.org. Anyway, this one's called The Lost Art of Humility. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own words, in your own opinion, sorry. That's Romans 12, 14 to 16. Why? Why does he tell us to associate with the humble? Could it be that he doesn't want us learning bad practices or becoming proud? Luke 14, verse 8 to 11. <clears throat> when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honourable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come to you and say, give your place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place. So that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. <clears throat> Doesn't it seem that human nature is the opposite of what Jesus tells us? Human nature would seem to have us do almost the exact opposite of what Jesus spoke and is recorded in the Bible. I was thinking about humility. I had 15 hours driving in the car this week. So I had a lot of time to think about stuff. And uh, humility can literally save your life. So a few weeks ago, we went to watch uh, Hamilton at the theatre. Anyone know how? So he's one of the founding fathers of America. Anyone know how he died? Guns at dawn, pistols at dawn. He, he died in a duel. Humility, humbling oneself can literally save your life. And I, then I started looking at who else has died because of jewels, and there's a huge list, an uh, amazing amount of people. And they died just because they couldn't settle their differences, so they had to shoot at each other. We don't really have jewels now, but we've got something called cancel. I have to cancel culture, family. What? Cancel culture. Yeah, not council culture. We've got something where your kind of your life can get destroyed. Just because social, there's a social media backlash, you know, yeah. and the people around you can be affected by that as well. It's it did seem like a um, a, a spiritual uh, modern version of the pistols at dawn, you know. Um, there's no discourse. It's just right. Let's go for that person just because someone happened to say the wrong thing. Pride, pride. The opposite of humility. Proverbs 11.2 When pride comes, then comes disgrace. It's pretty clear that. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 16.5 Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And 1 John 2.15 love not the world neither the things in it that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of this world and the world passes away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the word the will of God abides forever. God hates 
pride. God hates pride, yet pride is being hardwired into our society. And we are encouraged to be proud, as if that was a virtue. We can see that even the facts of life will be changed to accommodate pride. Even our Prime Minister could not bring himself to define what a woman is to facilitate pride. Like the Pharisees who were responsible for the death of Jesus, pride does blind people to the truth or just distorts the truth. And because of this, the facts have to be changed. And therefore, eventually, if no one speaks out the truth, the entire context changes. Yet the truth is the truth. You can't change the truth, but the context can change. I, uh, pride, if you start thinking about pride, I don't think anyone fully understands the subtleties in which this can affect people's lives and the society that we live in. But it's surely from the devil, and it is a great source of evil in this world. What is called sin is a virtue, and what is a virtue is called sin. The world without God is one of complete confusion. And that, my friends, is the context we operate and live in now. So the last sermon, last month, I talked about values and how values can affect behavior. Um, and values help us prioritize our lives. Well, what affects values? Well, it's the context in which we operate in. Context is the circumstances that form the setting for an event, a statement, or idea, and in terms of which it can be fully understood. Okay? The Latin is contextus, which means con, together, and textus, to weave. So it's all the little detail, the environment, the atmosphere in which we operate is that context. And societies operate within this context one may say they are the result of the context. So in a godless context, how can faith be understood? It says, in the, def the definition from that Oxford Bible is that only in the right context can things be fully understood. So this is why we get confusion, because that context keeps changing. If we keep changing the circumstances to suit our desires that are against God, we move further and further away from a context and the result in society that can fully understand God. That's what you end up with. And as soon as I thought that, I'm thinking, well, that's another reason why we shouldn't forsake meeting up together. We should not forsake coming to church in person if we can physically do it because we're bringing ourselves into a God-based context. Changing the context doesn't just happen overnight. As soon as we're outside the church, and we know that the church isn't the building, it's the people. And as soon as we start missing this gathering together with other believers, or we end up in a church where the senior people move away from the Bible, we're outside of this godly context. And unless, and unless we are surrounded by believers at home, at work, wherever we might spend our time, we're always out of that context. So what happens? Do we change the context for them so that they can understand God? Or do we accept the context that we find ourselves in and we start actually understanding the world and the, world, the way it works? If we look at examples of human behavior, the majority of people are affected by the context in which they operate. A good example is celebrities. You get some, some you know, working class celebrity who makes millions, totally changes their life. Their context changes and they conform to this context. They have this bubble and they operate within that. Totally changes their life and they reflect the context in which they're operating in. 
interesting actually some of them some of the ones that don't succumb to that they say things like well with strong enough roots it's because of my roots I haven't changed I've got my roots where I was brought up I was brought up over there and that's where you know I'm still there in spirit we can learn from that though we definitely can learn from that they can withstand the context because they've got strong enough roots and they can remain true to themselves and they don't come un undone by everything that's going on around them. So stay away from meeting up with Christians. You will most likely start to be affected by a different context. One that, one that is very much unholy. It really is. Uh, this is why we need to be working at deepening our roots, you know, in Christ on the word, in the spirit, deepening our roots in Christianity and our humbling reliance on God, knowing that we don't work in our own strength. Only then can we withstand the changing context in the world and also have strength to change that context for good. You're, you're, what you, your testimony, Linda, is, you know, we have an attempt to bring God into the world and to change the context that's going on in that moment. Practically, though, this, this kind of context thing affects two areas, or there's two areas of Christian life I want to focus, in, focus on and home in on. Witnessing and sin. Before we get into that, though, I have heard uh, Christians being labelled as rebels because they don't just go with the flow, and that's quite right. Christians shouldn't just go with the flow of society and the world. Christians affect a higher authority, God. Elion, Elion. So this is an epithet of God. So this is the word that the Israelites described God. Elion, El Elion. And it, in the English, the nearest English translation is God Most High. There is... There is nothing higher. We can choose to ignore that, but the fact remains that there is nothing higher than God. No one can change that fact. Psalm 97, 9. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. What are all gods? Anything else we care to put before God. Yeah? This is why we walk a different path. And it is this walk with God that sanctifies us, that sets us apart from the rest of the world. Yet like pride, our current context encourages us to put ourself and the lust of the flesh and our feelings before God. Applying more weight to our self-expression than obedience to God. I might go digital next time. Um, so, so yeah, God is a God of order. He doesn't want us to go with the flow. He definitely doesn't want us to do that. Um, there is, one thing we can remember is that there, there's a really narrow path to salvation. And the wide path is to destruction. That's where the flow is. You need to step out of that. God does want us to obey the rule of law looking at this this week as well. God wants us to obey the rule of law. But what happens when the rule of law is against the Ten Commandments of what God wants? We're not a million miles away from that now. You can see where it's going. Where we will have a choice to obey the laws of our society and our country or follow God. And it might become much worse think about this as well so one of the well the fastest growing part of our society and definitely religion is islam we live in a wonderful democracy which is something for the people and as soon as the majority of people start voting things in that's what happens so if we ended up with islamic leaders and sharia law imagine that it's not unthinkable that one day we might have to convert to Islam to access the best universities or social support. That, that is the resort of democracy. What do we do then as Christians? Our leaders have been gambling that that won't happen. 
our leaders have been gambling that the Islam like traditional Christianity will become worldly before that kind of thing happens however that's not the case if you look at the facts just this week in Sweden the leaders in Sweden have said put their hands up this has gone really really wrong with all of the different people that they've been bringing into their country they gambled that they would assimilate the Swedish life and they'd be part of the Swedish culture and what has happened they brought their own culture in and there's no assimilation and now there's massive fraction and, yeah, and conflict within that society because the majority shifted okay Sweden's the first there are many similar Western European countries just the same so back to context if your context is the world then Christians have to be righteous rebels don't they if your context is church then we are aiming for perfect obedience to the word it's interesting I started looking at rebels when I got back the word rebel doesn't appear in the New Testament it appears in the Old Testament 14 times and every time almost every time it is to depict going against God being rebellious towards God interestingly not society it's always the other way looking at God for example in Job 24 13 they are those that rebel against the light they know not the ways thereof nor abide in the paths thereof and in Isaiah uh, chapter 1 verse 20 but if you refuse and rebel you shall be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it so just because society has changed it doesn't mean the Ten Commandments have changed it doesn't mean they don't apply since God gave them to Moses they have applied and they are so important that Jesus had to die on the cross to save us from the judgment of them in the context of an unbelieving world pride makes sense actually it does if you put yourself away from God and you take yourself out of a godly focused context but when the context is God it's ridiculous it's totally ridiculous to put the self above the creator so the context can make the same behavior look madness or virtue it's the context that changes everything that's how important it is first Corinthians verse chapter 9 verse cha chapter 6 verse 9 know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners none of these shall inherit the kingdom of God this is our context this is only our context because we have been washed 1st Corinthians chapter 6 verse 11 we are washed we are sanctified and we are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God this is the truth that's the truth of God and no one can change that but but the adversary will do his best to pull you away from the truth from that stronghold especially if our roots aren't deep enough and aren't strong enough so back to the practical implications of this context sin so if everybody's doing it does it make it acceptable to you individually if everybody's doing it does it make it acceptable to you and so straight away I'm thinking of two things the Nazis wiping out the Jews that was a contextual thing people normal people thought that was okay because the total context was mad or white lies perpetuating the myth of Santa both are driven by evil and context we see this at work in the traditional church that traditional church seems totally focused on conforming the Bible to the world trying to adapt and adjust things to make that 
more palatable to the worldly context in which it operates in. But the Bible tells us that God cannot live, cannot be where sin is. And both murder and lying are sin. So if we live a sin, in a sinful culture, if we live in a sinful culture, we need to be really, really careful. Because more often than not, we are going to be in a sinful context. Paul and Peter wrote loads about the importance of diligence. That's a great study. I encourage you to go away and have a look at that. The importance of diligence, having a diligent faith, making sure you're saying the right things, you're doing the right things, you're putting God first, you're looking at the word so that you don't accidentally trip over some of these things because there are a lot of things to trip over in this world. So as the context continues to change, we find ourselves more and more at odds with it as Christians. This is why we need to be diligently growing our faith. Our roots of faith in every, every aspect of our life, leaving no stone unturned. Witnessing. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, so that, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. So witnessing, 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 we have, to change, we have to change the context. The whole point of witnessing is changing the context of what people think. This is the whole point. This is why we are the salt and the light. When we talk about God, things change. People's opinions, people's thoughts, people's processes, people's reactions. Even when we are in the most awkward situations, we have to hold fast to the profession of our faith. It's easy doing it when we're at church. Because that's our context isn't it? It's easy to lift your hands up and worship God. Go and do that down the supermarket. Go and do that down at the football. I think all the batteries are running out. Anyway, um, God wants us to declare the word of the Lord without wavering. And it can be difficult to speak about God when all the conversations are very, very hollow sometimes or indeed antichrist. It can seem out of context. It can even seem ridiculous to talk about God sometimes. So it's really, really important that Christians learn how to change the context. This can be done through behaviour. Again, that's really difficult because it requires a strength of character to do something different than everybody else is doing. Or enough faith to physically do something different. Or we can simply use words. So we're given the sword of the spirit. The only offensive weapon is speaking the word of God. So we need to remember that. We're learning on Bible study how to communicate effectively. Why do you think we're doing that? Because the most effective way of communicating with someone is changing that context. And how? what's the most effective way of changing the context? By asking questions. So effective communications and Bible studies is there to help us evangelize and witness. We can change that context by asking the questions. It's so simple. Something as simple as what are you doing at the weekend, most of the time will result, if you ask someone that, what are they going to ask you? What are you doing at the weekend? Wow, brilliant. And all you have to do then is kick the ball over the line and tell her you're going to church because it's bloody marvellous. It's fantastic. And it's really important to have that a a apologies that worldly word. The blood is marvellous because it sanctifies us. And we can even express that. It's fulfilling though. And there's something fulfilling. I don't know if anyone else gets this, but there's a lot of stuff in my life that tries to stop me getting here on a Sunday. And when I'm here... It's the best place to be. It's so funny. Often it's the case. I come here and it just feels right. We learn about God. You know, there's nothing higher than God. 
So we are educated beyond the ways of the world. Our minds have been open to accept something by the Holy Spirit that is beyond what the world can offer. So it is fulfilling. And then we can ask them what they're getting up to with God. What do they know about God? So it does sound too easy. Don't forget, as a believer in Christ, you are both intellectually and spiritually enlightened. You're in an illuminated position. Hebrews 10, 24, again. I just wanted to make a point about it. I don't know how this fits in, but let us consider one another to provoke unto love, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Humility. Humility. It's so easy when we get provoked to do good, to take it the wrong way, and to stop turning up to church, or to resent something, or or to just let the pride come in. It needs humility. We need humility. And I've seen this. When that happens, so we're always provoking people to try and do more. That's, That's one of Mark's strengths. I can remember when we talked about setting up a church and life would be a lot easier just going to, joining a church that doesn't provoke, which is big enough for me to remain anonymous. Yeah, so come and go, no one will really notice. But I know going to a church with a pastor that follows the word, that's full of the Holy Spirit, I will be provoked to do more. My flesh reels at that, but I know what is right. I know the truth and the facts of the Bible. This church is a gym. Think about it like that. It's a gym for faith. That provoking to do good works and to do more for God strengthens our roots. It grows our faith. And what does that do? It produces a healthy spirit. Doesn't it? Just like what we say. If we can try and do more of these things, we feel better about ourselves. Yet the flesh tries to go against that all the time. I was thinking about CERN. often think about CERN. So the atom smashing thing. So everyone know about CERN, yeah? Oh, so they're they're trying... It's this multi-billion pound project in Switzerland. And they are trying to fire atoms into other atoms to see... To get really small. And they say they're getting close to the Big Bang. You know, 0.0001 second after... They throw absolutely billions of pounds at this project. An unbelievable amount. They've just wound it up to 15 trillion electron volts. That's how much power it takes. Why? And I was thinking that they, the only, well, two things. A lot of them are Christians who work there because they see the order. So they are, fire, they are breaking atoms and getting things smaller and smaller and smaller. And at every level there is total order to everything. Everything is in order. But then I think about the other side, and there's this constant human aim to try and find something, disprove God in some way, so that, that, so that we can do whatever we want to do, so that we can be our own gods. And I think there's more reason on that side of the camp than there is on, wow, we've got another thing. There's something small called buckyballs. Wow, who cares about that? doesn't really make any difference. Yet, they've ploughed billions of pounds into it that could be used elsewhere just to try and disprove God. Yet, they, a lot of them get converted in the process. Truth. Truth. So, so we live in a context, I think we, most of us would agree on that, that doesn't really value truth, let's say, as much as it used to. Uh, and when a society starts to move away from the truth, it's in all kinds of trouble. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. My, um, my children at school, um, they got taken on a local trip to a, a local mosque. And... Um, they had to do that because the week before they had a little trip to a local church. Um, 
And it was all conducted in the same way that you would go to a museum. Totally whitewashed experience. No facts about the truth, because we can't talk about the truth. As a society, we are not allowed to talk about the truth. My children have not been given the correct context to understand what they've seen. Even what they are doing there. What's the point? And the truth is distorted by our context. We, a few, about a month ago now, we discussed this type of thing at the Bible study and how one of the things Satan does is take stuff out of context to sow confusion and move us away from God. Putting Jesus on the same level as people like Buddha, Confucius, and other similar religious leaders is exactly really what the Pharisees did 2,000 years ago. And the more I read this Bible, I can see that, yeah, we say this society is bad. It's probably been worse. There's been examples in the Bible of stuff being a lot worse. Um, and it just keeps going round and round and round. But 2,000 years ago, and it shows how little understanding there is, that people could put Jesus on the same level as these things, these, these other men. It's just simply incorrect. Where did Jesus come from? It's the only one of those given to us from God. Yet our context has made it difficult to appreciate, to understand the truth, even to digest the truth because of the sin that is prevalent in society. As a result, people have started to accept that there might not be an ultimate truth, God. And as a result, their values change. And once this disease is left unchecked by the people who were responsible for checking it, it becomes difficult to turn it around. It is like a disease. It's a spiritual disease. As a church, as a Bible-believing, spirit-filled church, we have a responsibility for the truth. That's a massive responsibility. Take, for example, like just this last month, the, there's a massive mix-up in our government and Western governments in particular be, between taking pride on unimportant issues and being humble to the point of self-destruction on incredibly important issues. Got it back to front. And th that, those issues affect every aspect of society. Look at Sweden. Where is the leadership? There's no clarity on leadership. There's no moral, ethical leadership at all. It's a decadent, baseless society and leadership that we have. Because without God, there is no true north, there is no firm foundation, and we're building our, we're building our society on sand. And there will be a day, a day of reckoning. It might be sooner than we think. Proverbs 1.7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instructions. Satan can't kill us, but the God of this world can adjust the systems in the world to change the context, which then changes our values and alters our behavior, if we let it, if we are not strong enough in the word. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Just the beginning. There's a lot more. We have to keep growing in wisdom. We have to keep staying humble, humble enough to receive more and more instruction. We sometimes think our comfort zone is more important than Jesus dying on the cross. We sometimes think our comfort zone is more important than Jesus dying on the cross. That's wrong. It's totally wrong thinking. That is worldly thinking. Forget about your comfort zone. He died for us to make us free so that we could have faith in God. And the weaker we are, the stronger we'll let God in our lives. We know, don't we? Some of us here have to get to the end of ourselves before we'd let God in. We've got a chance. But we let him in, and that's all that matters. So Jesus died so that people could inherit eternal life. So that we could no longer be limited and confined to our own strength or remain a product of what we were born into. Jesus died as the final sacrifice for sin 
so that we could be free and have his inheritance. So we get the inheritance of the Son of God in heaven to look forward to. We have that to look forward to. So that's why we can be happy. That's why it's so important to come to church because sometimes if I didn't think about that because our eyes have been open to this I was blindly in all this and you know couldn't see it for what it was because we are so blinded from the truth but we can be happy because this isn't everything we've got much more to live for if we stop short though of telling people about this and then teaching them the word of God we make all of that of non-effect the Bible isn't something we can adjust to suit our current society and subsequent lifestyles. It's the opposite. Our lifestyles have to reflect what the Bible tells us is right. That's the point of the Bible, to give us guidance. And it's God's law. It's literally set in stone. For God to be good, he has to punish sin. If you think about that, you can't not be good and let sin go. I think we can all misjudge the impact of small sin and how that keeps us away from God and God working in our lives. Sin matters massively. Big or small, it's all sin and it separates us from God. And we are either separated from him or we're with him. There's no middle ground. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Satan will always try and get you to think that you have no choice, that you're just a victim. Whereas we always have a choice in how we react to circumstances, how we react to a context. When things go wrong, do we seek God first or not? Life is a bit like a process. Well, it is a process. And it's a process of finding out the true true value of things. And it's really important we understand the value of trying to live a repentant life. Trying to live a repentant life. It's not good enough just to say that you've accepted God. You've accepted Jesus and repented. It's our actions, it's our intentions, and our words that get judged. We are totally reliant upon the blood of Jesus Christ to save us from this sin. Thank God for that. Exodus 32, 33. We're going to go through some scripture here. The Lord said unto Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, him I will blot out of my book. What book? Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So why is Christ so important? Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not block out his name of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Thank you, Jesus Christ. I let you into my life because of that. I thank you. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And so... The logical approach is to remain in Christ Jesus at all times. It's our protective layer. Regardless what anyone says, regardless what happens around us, remember what Jesus has given us. Remember what Jesus has saved us from and be grateful. Don't let that truth be hidden by the stuff we see in our lives. Those who forget are short-sighted even to blindness. They have forgotten their purification from their old sins. God came not to rub it in, but to rub it out. And to give us that freedom to operate as we were supposed to be made. This is the only context we need to view things from. This is our context. We are the only ones that have a context like this. It's the context of God, eternity, purpose, the salvation of our souls, Remember this and have peace. Do not be downhearted. Do not conform to the world. There is nothing in this world equal to salvation. Life is all about God. 
but because we've let the context and society change our purpose, our values, and our behavior, humans continue to get it wrong, get it so wrong. And disorder and sin increase as a result. We know that. This is what this tells us. The less of God in anyone's life, the more sin, the more disorder happens. Do not fall into the same trap. Where else can you go for eternal life? There's no other option. Yeah, sometimes it might be difficult to turn up to church. What are you going to do instead? I promise you, it's nowhere near as important as an eternity. So celebrate being different. Celebrate being different. Change that context. Have a go. Getting people to think differently. And let's save some souls. A wise man saves souls. Finally, Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Remember, love, true love, never gives up. Do we love God? I do. And no matter how bad it gets, I will not give up. Father, I just want to pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for granting us understanding today. I thank you for making it extremely clear. As Mark said earlier, there are no mysteries. Your spirit, your word, life, testimony. It's true. It's real. It's more real than everything else. Yet, sometimes it can feel like it's not. And that's when we're outside of that context. Father, give us strength. Help us remember and stand upon your word. Bring the scripture into our minds. Let us speak your word, Lord, because you say it will never come back for you. You've given us that word to use. So let's use it in the world. Let's change that world from humble beginnings, humble in our heart, small beginnings, great things can happen. And Lord, we know that through your word, it will never die. There will always be a remnant. There will always be someone standing up for the truth. There will always be someone that does not bow the knee to Baal. Father, even one person not doing that is important. So Father, just help us remember that. Help us have the peace, the perfect peace, knowing that you will strengthen us in our time of need that you will bless us as we go in and out, that no matter what we do wrong, if we come back, if we repent, if we turn around and follow you, you will forgive us. If we come to you, Lord, you will come to us. And Father, I am grateful for that. There are no other promises like that in the world. So, Lord, thank you for today. Bless this church. Bless the people in it. Bless our families through us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.